I had a chance to meet a gentleman who I uh, have been impressed with for a long time. A long, 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 long time. I'll, I'll age you very quickly, Earl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Earl Bennett, who was known as, uh, well, still is known as Sir Frederick Gass, is on the line. And, of course, you were with Spike Jones for a good many years, right? Yeah, we were closing in on the 8th when uh, I got tired of one-nighters and went home. <laughs> Anybody who's ever seen the movie The Egg and I has uh, seen you. In fact, I went back purposely because I have that one on tape. I went back purposely to see if I could spot you. And there you are dancing with uh, Claudette Colbert. Yes, yeah. That was my first time on a soundstage. And uh, there was big, heavy strikes going on. And uh, they got special dispensation, I guess would be the word, from the uh, unions to finish this one film because they were sort of halfway through it. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, she came down with flu or a bad cold or she had a high fever. And she was not a very, in a very good frame of mind. And uh, so my first time on stage, on a sound stage, and my first time in front of a motion picture camera, I was pretty green. And uh, she wasn't feeling well and she forgot her line. And when the... We stood and stared at each other because I didn't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> the director says, cut. And uh, <laughs> he says, what happened? And I just turned to him quite simply and said, she forgot her line. And she, <laughs> you just don't do that to stars. <laughs> she said, oh, no, you forgot. Oh, and yeah, it was your fault because you were new. I did, yeah, I forgot. Oh. And uh, so uh, this, I'm, I'm so old now, I can't remember the fellow's name. He was an awfully nice chap. Uh, he's uh, married to Ella Fitzgerald. Now, whoever Ella Fitzgerald's husband was, he was a producer-director there. Oh, and, uh, and I bet you somebody will come up with that. Yeah, well, it would be interesting to see if they can uh, uh, come up with that one, because he was very nice to me and took good care of me. He knew I was how green I was on the stage. Yeah. That was pretty much your character uh, when you were uh, seen later on, too. I mean, you were dressed kind of the same way, weren't you? Yes. Yeah, when I uh, auditioned for Spike, he said, well, no slicker suit for you. He said that the baggy pants and, the, you know, that baggy pants have been around ever since as a burlesque, I guess. And uh, he said, that's fine. Sir Frederick Gass will wear the, the uh, tails and the baggy pants. And so for a long time, I was the only one in the troupe that uh, was dressed differently. I yeah. didn't have a slicker suit. Now, you're from Kansas City originally, aren't you? Uh, well, oh, yes, actually, because uh, I was born in Kansas City, Kansas, and uh, sort of grew up over in Clay County, uh, which is across the river, and now that's surrounded by Kansas City, mm -hmm. and went to art school in Kansas City, and Kansas City's hometown. That's, that's where all the old-timers, all the old buddies are. So how did this show business thing start? I mean, if you're used to doing art, and I guess you do that kind of thing nowadays, don't you? Well, now, starting... Uh, <laughs> People are awful tired of hearing us old folks talk about hard times and depression, but uh, those were hard times, and uh, actually they were so hard it was difficult to even come by enough money to buy food, and as an art student, I missed a few meals. And uh, so, oh, probably for psychological reasons as well, I did things to attract attention to myself, and I could get laughs, and, uh, and I also would get invited to uh, dinner parties. <laughs> uh -huh. I studied with Thomas Hart Benton there in Kansas City at the Art Institute. Yeah. And when uh, the wealthy folks would invite Tom out for a, an evening with a big artist, big famous artist, he would select a few guys that he thought would be fun to have at the party and say, why don't you invite old Earl or whoever? And, the, and then I'd get to walk by those buffets piled high with uh, roast beef and uh, <laughs> those beautiful little brown potatoes and... <laughs> And I wasn't above stuffing my pockets with a little bit. Of <laughs> <laughs> take some of that home, yeah. yeah. A little plastic liner in the uh, yeah. coat pocket allows you to take the soup out, at least. Only cost was if you get a laugh out of the wealthy patrons. <laughs> and uh, So, I, you know, you just you learn to survive. Yeah. How'd you get teamed up with the band? Well, uh, I learned to fool around in, in school and uh, attract attention and, uh, and get a meal or two. And then... Uh, in the when the World War II came along, they would have these great concentrations of uh, men in these bases and or in warehousing before they shipped them overseas or whatever. Or uh, like we used to go across from San Francisco up into the mountains, and I don't suppose that military secret anymore. But uh, over in Sausalito and above Sausalito in Marin County, those mountains were practically hollow with great 16-inch rifles in them for the coastal protection, you know, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so those poor guys couldn't even come out of those tunnels in the daytime because they were supposed to be such uh, 
hidden secret. And we'd go over and go in those tunnels at night and, and, and entertain the guys. You take a few people from a YMCA, a singer and a dancer and, and a comic, and put them in the back of one of those old recons. And, and uh, it was a great need. For, they, weren't, they weren't particular. You didn't have to be very talented, just willing to ride around for miles and miles. In this but somebody place. spotted you, and they must have liked you. Well, uh, then uh, it, you just keep at it. Uh, the, uh, all the, my uh, COs decided that I had a lot more to offer as an entertainer than as a guy with a, <laughs> with a rifle. <laughs> and I was kind of glad of that myself. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so... Uh, Better be a comedian than... Uh, I hate to see a comedian with a rifle, come to think of it. <laughs> well, well, I wasn't that much of a soldier. I just <laughs> I didn't hit the target very often out on the rifle range. Yeah. But, I want to ask you about one of the one of the most uh, famous things, and if anybody's had a chance to listen to the Spike Jones band, of course, you recognize this high reed, and that's something you played what uh, with, with your tongue. It's a pretend... It looks like you're playing a stick, like a violin, but that's yeah. not the case. It's, a, it's, a, it's an optical illusion. It's a little bit of... Uh, uh, deception, or uh, I wouldn't say I was a ventriloquist, but it's, it borders on that. Yeah. Now, as a kid, I had one of those things. I could never make it work. How in the... You didn't have the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> you had to see, you waited too long to call me. <laughs> you could have been a famous comedian. <laughs> but no, I, uh, I started off doing that with a re with a, uh, using a, a, a thin green leaf in the springtime. And Mac, as a matter of fact, the first uh, reed, and I'll call it that, was a maple key, which I think all Midwesterners are familiar with. It comes spiraling down out of maple trees in the spring. Oh, they look like little helicopters. Yeah. And, yeah. and the kids would put those in their mouth and make them squawk. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe I'll look a little better to the, to the big guys if I can make a tune, and I did that. Oh, and then the idea for the act was, uh, uh, back in those days, life was simpler, and... Uh, we had harmless people in, in these little towns that were, uh, nowadays they would be institutionalized, but they were, they were functioning quite well. Back then they put them on stage, right? Well, they were accepted, and, uh, and there was a wonderful old man there uh, who would go up and down the street singing to himself, and he made himself assistant fire chief sign on his hat with a pencil, and, and he, he was just delightful and, and completely harmless. And one time I saw old Topsy, dancing down the street with two sticks of wood and, and pretending he was playing a violin. So I wasn't hard to, to go from that to uh, using this uh, maple key <laughs> and two sticks of wood. Yeah. Your character was kind of that of a, uh, uh eccentric professor, really, wasn't it? Well, yeah, you know, a timid so You know, the truth is, the truth is that when I would walk out on stage, certainly in the beginning, I was terrified. I was... <laughs> I was very frightened, and and I learned to cash in on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, people thought that well, people always think that's very funny to see a frightened little man on stage. I guess that's right. You know, you look at Don Knotts, and he was the known for the, his nervousness. And then you learn to manipulate them by by uh, uh, walking around uh, afraid of your own shadow and so forth. So then the only thing you have to be afraid of is how am I going to look like I'm shy and nervous, right? After a while, when you get comfortable doing it. You get comfortable with it. Uh, and, tr and to tell you the truth, that's actually kind of what happened down through the years. See, we would play this, even though we played every town, uh, uh, those itineraries are fantastic. Get those old itineraries. And Cleveland, Mississippi, and, <laughs> you know, we just didn't miss a town. Yeah. And, and pretty soon you're circling around and doing the same thing over and over, and uh, it just got... It got very stale. You know, the air was bad. You just, uh, <laughs> yeah. it just you couldn't get your breath after a while. I'll tell you, Spike Jones surrounded himself with good people, and you were certainly one of those. George. For a while. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, and I'm glad I did. It was, great. It was, it was certainly, uh, it was devastating in many ways because, uh, well, I went through a couple of marriages, and, uh, and that happened to a lot of us. There's, a, there's quite a cost to this going away from home and, Getting back two weeks out of the year, say, so That's right. with a big uh, popular band like that. Yeah. You were one of the people that would be considered uh, more of a comedian, I suppose, than, an, than a musician, although you were f certainly... F I wasn't a musician at all. But you were featured on some of the numbers, certainly, playing the... Uh... Well, that's in the back door. That's, I always thought <laughs> that in that way I resembled Ella Logan because I heard her say one time that she was in the back door that she couldn't read a note. <laughs> okay. 
There are people like, oh, let's say, Freddie Morgan messed around, although he was a fine banjo player, wasn't he? He was a good musician. Yeah. And he also composed some music that uh, did yeah. fairly well. What are your recollections about George Rock, since he has roots back here? Rock, oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> that's so corny to say it, but Rock was a rock, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. He really was the... Uh, uh, he was the keystone, the, the, the key man. Uh, the show could go right on through with just George out there keeping things going, if you know what I mean, musically. He had uh, he had an ability to play the trumpet like nobody else. Plus, he had uh, he had the physical uh, ability to make people laugh, I would think, because of his stature, right? You know, well, George was, uh, he was really uh, kind of Superman in a sense that uh, we would play these auditoriums where there'd be eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 people. And he'd be the melody. That trumpet was the melody. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people thought about that much. But. You know, and here's something that surprised me, and I didn't know this until George showed me one of his uh, tapes, I guess. Uh, in fact, uh, I have to bring this up, too, before I forget. But I was always under the impression there were several trumpet players. And I'm watching this tape, and I said, George, uh, where's, where's the rest of your help there? You're not doing all that, are you? <laughs> yeah. He was it. He was it. <laughs> <laughs> and the people loved it, and, and they were satisfied with what George produced. Yeah. And he was a great... Uh, he was a great guy to, uh, oh, not pal around with, because George was a very private man, but uh, uh, he had a great sense of humor, or at least his humor and mine sort of paralleled. And uh, we shared many, many laughs. Uh, we just had a great time uh, with the little uh, Italian midget, Frankie Little. <laughs> George just absolutely loved that little guy. He told me a story one time about playing and all of a sudden noticing out the corner of his eye that Frankie Little was smoking a cigar. The problem was he was just wearing a large pair of pants that covered his head, so the cigar stuck out the fly. Right, right. yeah. And this would just break George. Would be, I don't know if you've ever heard George laugh, but he had a high, high-pitched, uh, I don't want to break your equipment, but he'd go, ha, ha, ha. And, of course, you knew who, who was laughing. That's absolutely right. I got to know him quite well near the end, and I'm glad I can say that he became a friend. Well, yeah. You're, yeah, anybody who got to really uh, know George is, can consider himself lucky. Yeah. May I go back, uh, because we missed one there. Uh, you asked how I got with Spike. Yeah. And uh, so <clears throat> when I finally, excuse me, got out of the Army, I had no idea what I was going to do during a living. I couldn't be an artist because I already had a couple of kids and I was married by that time. And uh, so people said, you know, Earl, you've actually got enough material and enough... Uh, experience now you could actually earn a living as an entertainer and uh, i didn't really believe that but i was desperate and i had to do something so i came to hollywood and and worked for free in these uh bear and pretzels and oleo and uh and variety act places if you know what i mean and uh for oh quite a few months as a matter of fact before one agent finally signed me up and then sent me around to nightclubs and I'd worked San Francisco's uh, 365 Club Bimbos and, and Billy Gray's Bandbox here in L.A. and uh, the uh, ill-fated place called the Cobar, which fell on its, <laughs> its head. But uh, Spike came in to San Francisco, and his favorite restaurant was Bimbo's 365. And so Bimbo said, I've got a guy that you ought to see. So I was away in Stockton at, Stockton at the time playing a, another ill-fated nightclub, and uh, so Spike called me, and uh, and Bimbo was, and the bunch, the people were so great, we used to, they used, was like family, and there was lots of pranks and jokes back and forth, and so when this guy said to me on the phone, I'm Spike Jones, I said, hi, I'm your mother's uncle, what can I do for you, <laughs> and I can't tell you because you want to broadcast this, what Jones said, but <laughs> he'd just gone through the same thing with Freddie Morgan, Freddie just didn't believe it was Spike talking to him, yeah. but he called, and I got on the the Silver Zephyr or whatever that thing was that used to run up and down the San Joaquin Valley and rushed into San Francisco and Bimbo brought the band and set up the whole the nightclub the whole thing except for the audience and I auditioned and uh, Joan says let's go across the street and talk business and that was it. Yeah, that's terrific. What a great group of guys it was and gals really. Well, yeah. Well, they were. Uh, <laughs> it was a unique. You know what it was? It was a, a, a brief revival of vaudeville. After a war, uh, people need to laugh. You know how how healing laughter is. Yep. So there was a hunger for, for a bunch of clowns to get out there and caper around like that, which gradually wore off. Uh, finally, people got over the war nerves and all that, and uh, 
we weren't as funny. They didn't need us as much. They just wanted and, uh, and music changed, though, too, didn't it? Oh, music changed to the point where, uh, where we were so archaic that, uh, that that just didn't work, that's all. Yeah. And we couldn't go ahead like uh, Fred Waring and his Pennsylvanians and, <laughs> and these other guys. Yeah. <laughs> we're depending that much on laughs. You had some hits. I was thinking of uh, the song that you and Sarah Burner, like, Hi, pinched ass. Operating around the Jack Benny show. Yeah, yeah. Sarah was a great, great uh, performer, a uh, great talent. Yeah. And uh, we thought we had a pretty good record. Tennessee vaults. Yeah, but the uh, Benet Brest just didn't think that there was time for for uh, us to be doing a, a, that heavy a Jewish accent and uh, uh, publicly, and so they put a stop to it for a long time. That was that was yanked off the shelves. It's a very funny recording. And first, in fact, the first time I heard it was many, many years after you guys recorded it, and I was rolling. I thought, hilarious! What a what a hilarious combination to put two uh, Jewish accents doing a country song. It was it was great. Well, we we were uh, like I say, Sarah and I, we were patting each other on the back. We thought we'd done something, but it just wasn't the right time for it. And then, if, uh, <laughs> and all several things that I did with Spike had this uh, <laughs> bad luck. Uh, uh, we did this Ghost Riders, which was so hot at the time. And uh, I'm the guy, I have to plead guilty, I'm the one to come up with the idea of making fun of Vaughn Monroe singing, because we all did. Yeah. And uh, In fact, that was a running gag, wasn't it, with you guys? Yeah. And Vaughn Monroe was a bigger seller than Spike Jones, and uh, and he also got to pull, uh, oh, God, I hope I think of his name, Stan Jones, who wrote that song, to go with him, and the two of them raised so much cane with... Uh, it was RCA Victor. I hope I haven't gone that far south, but uh, <laughs> they they just pulled it off, and they didn't hear that. And then they even talked Spike into changing the end of it, mm -hmm. take that curse of, off of it. Where uh, Dick Morgan says, "I I think I said, 'Cause all we hear is Ghost Riders sung by Von Monroe.'" And Dick Morgan says, oh, "I can't do without his singing." And I said, "But I'd like to have his dough." And boy, oh boy. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> that opened up a can of worms, did it? Oh, I'm afraid so. Yeah. Poor old Spike. He'd listen to my ideas sometimes to his, his loss. <laughs> <laughs> Vaughn Monroe didn't have the greatest sense of humor, evidently, then. No, no. I think Vaughn Monroe was convinced he was actually a, a misplaced opera singer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you about another one, and I guess it was done uh, by somebody else originally, but uh, at least on the video that I happened to see, you also did Chloe. Oh yeah, well that uh, that just I just fell heir to that along with a few other things. Uh, uh, you know, Red. Nobody ever did Chloe like Red Engel. Nobody. Yeah. And we all know that. I don't know what Red would have done visually, but I saw you do it, and visually you do a uh, funny delivery with the telephone and all the rest of it. And by the way, who did the voice on the phone? That you did it. Now there, I wanted. I was. I'm glad you brought it up because it wouldn't have been a thing without Freddie Morgan. Freddie Morgan was the guy on the offstage mic, and his timing was so sensational. He was so dependable. He was so uh, like a marriage made in heaven. Anytime you got on stage with Freddie, his timing and that face of his, uh, when Freddie and I would appear immediately, we'd, I was the straight man and Freddie was the comedian, you know, and I didn't mind it a bit. But, <laughs> it, it was, but that's him going, bah, 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 and you say, oh, I yeah. think that's my wife. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, Freddie was uh, <laughs> just just a love to work with. He really was. I, that was one of the most satisfying things in the world was to find someone that you could work with and be so dependable, you know, he yeah. was just this, right there. This guy had a face that was made out of rubber. Oh, what a face. He's got to be one of the funny men of, uh, of uh, all time in America. That face, is, I don't think there's been one quite that, quite that hilarious. A guy who could just, he instinctively knew what, what to do with that face mm -hmm. and react to the audience. And there was... Yeah, there were so many people in the band. One of the first people I ever met from the Spike Jones band was a fellow by the name of, oh, now I can't think of it, he's the juggler that uh, juggled the oh, battle Bill action. King. <laughs> Bill King, yeah. Bill King, I better be careful. If I, if I tell some of the stories I know, Bill King will come all the way from Muncie, Indiana and get me. <laughs> <laughs> I had, uh, yeah, Bill King and Jackie were uh, touring, I guess maybe they're still on the road for all I know. Uh, he was. I, I wouldn't doubt it. Tell you the truth, I think he's indestructible. <laughs> he was. He was doing. He'd played our fair a number of times here in town. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, he had some uh, interesting things to say. And of course, he was not a musician either. He was strictly uh, out front guy, whatever, a juggler, and uh, yeah. and a good juggler. He was a great comedian. He got lots of laughs, 
and he would just break George and I and a lot of us up because he he could get these laughs on stage. And one day he said he was trying to uh, make out with the ladies, and he said, "Oh gosh," he said, "if I just." It could be as funny off stage as I am on, you know. <laughs> he, want, he wanted to use that to attract the, the ladies, and uh, <laughs> didn't have a whole lot of luck, huh? It didn't. That just didn't work off stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, he he also uh, could eat fire, so maybe that had some effect. I would think he'd have some hot lips or whatever. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, he was the world's greatest juggler, and yet he was the world's. Forgive me, Bill, if you're listening, but he was the world's clumsiest juggler. <laughs> <laughs> He used to balance himself on the footlights and, and toss a ball out in the audience. Maybe he's probably still doing that when you and he worked for your fairs. Yeah, yeah. And the people would throw the ball back and he'd catch it and so forth. And somebody threw it just a tad short, and Bill jumped off the footlights and landed on top of an old uh, upright piano that was in the pit. And this was in the Great Northern Theater in Chicago. Mm. And uh, so when he, to, to save it, why, he, he shoved off and leaped backwards, you know, give it quite a shove to come throw get himself back on stage and when he did he tipped the poor old piano over <laughs> and the thing just sort of rolled out kind of easy like in slow motion and then went down there was a great cloud of dust and musical instruments and, and music racks and music flying up in the air and the audience thought that was part of the show <laughs> and George Rock Rock Lecton never got straightened out enough to go on with the show because he just killed he just fell apart <laughs> It was kind of a band of merry idiots at times, right? Oh, God, I'll tell you. Uh, there was some, some wonderful, wonderful moments that helped a lot, because uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's not all beer and Skittles or Skittles and beer, uh, that one-nighter thing, I'll tell you. It's just not. Yeah, it has its, it has its fine memories for you, but also it, it had to be a, a real haul being on the, on the road all the time. All you, guys, you guys traveled by train, didn't you? Yes, for a long time we did, and that was... Uh, not only was that uh, convenient, but it saved <laughs> saved a lot of hotel bills. Because <laughs> yeah. when we got off on the bus, we had to buy we had to pay our own room. Then. Oh, but, right. How about you travel all over the world, didn't you? Oh no, no. I my traveling's been. Uh, we my wife and I went to. You mean as an entertainer? Yeah. Oh no, no. Just Hawaii. We spent uh, uh, a dream like vacation for eighteen days in Hawaii with Spike, because Hawaii wanted to be the forty uh, ninth state. Okay, I was under the impression the band probably went all over, but uh... the band did. Mm -hmm. Now Spike did. He 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 uh, played England and uh, Australia, and uh, they traveled a lot. Yeah, and were, were very well received, by the way. But wouldn't take everybody along. I, well, I just wasn't there when they did those things. I see. I was lucky enough to be around when we went to Hawaii and got that royal, royal Hawaiian treatment, and we really did. We were uh, <laughs> everything was red carpet all the way. And yeah. The only thing was nobody in Hawaii laughed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would put a damper on the whole thing. Well, Spike says, just keep going through the motions. Says, <laughs> we're paying us, let's do it. <laughs> but they just didn't know what we were doing. And uh, <laughs> there was a guy, a fellow named Guy Raymond, who you see in a lot now in bit parts, and, and uh, or, or uh, you did. Uh, Raymond's getting old like me now. But uh, but he was uh, he replaced Weaver on that Hawaiian trip. Uh, and uh, so uh, you're talking about doodles, right? Doodles, yeah. yeah poor old doodles, bless his heart. Uh, he he did a guy Raymond of all people did a hillbilly routine, and he had a actor actor proof and surefire routine that got to where one point he'd say simmer down, simmer down, because everybody laughed so hard. And in a way, <laughs> he had to resort to simmer up, <laughs> which broke us up. <laughs> Earl, it's nice to talk to you. Hey, it's awfully nice of you to call, and, and remember, uh, not that many people do. Well, I tell you, the fan, the ones that an old guy like me. No, no, the ones that do really are big fans. And uh, there's a there's a video, uh, I think three videos out now. I recommend the first two, and then uh, I'll just uh, go mood on the third. <laughs> okay. Plus, a special uh, interview was done with you, and an interview with uh, George back here in Illinois. That's put together in some program, and I don't know if that's supposed to be on public public television or whatever. But oh, I think you're talking about the documentary that was. Uh, uh, the Spike Jones story, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That should be seen uh, shortly if it's if it's not on yet. Yeah, well, I'm sure that the guy who put that together would be delighted if you promoted that little airtime for that. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I would too. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs>
Okay. Okay. All, all the best to you, Sir Frederick Gass. And, uh, Thank you so much for calling. It's, it's really, it was a pleasure to meet you there in Farmer City, and it's a joy to talk to you now. Have a real great time.